uh, Nifi, um, our assistant professor. She will moderate the session. And, um, and so over to you, uh, Jessica. Okay, so I'm going to start by um, just going through some, you know, myths and facts about PhDs um, and then hand it over to colleagues who are going to talk about universities um, in different places around the world and what the application process looks like. So one moment as I share my screen. Ooh. There we go. Can you see that? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so do you want to do a PhD? So we're going to talk about some myths and facts about PhD programs and why you would or wouldn't want to do a PhD. So of course, we're going to talk about, you know, why you would get a PhD, you know, where the financing comes from, what the experience is like, what do you do after a PhD, and then, of course, the application process um, and how that differs uh, across uh, universities in different parts of the world. We have people who are going to specifically talk about um, some specific PhD programs in different um, regions and then have someone who's going to speak about the timeline of getting prepared for your applications. So why do you get a PhD? So there are many reasons that people pursue PhDs. Um, some would do them to be a professor. Others do them for their jobs. I have had colleagues who actually worked for governments who then paid for them to come do PhDs um, in order to come back and work for in their government job with their PhDs. They do it for the love of a subject, and some do it because of legacy and that they want to be the person who writes the big book or gets the big awards. However, a lot of one of the myths is that this is the only way to reach the next level. Um, and that's one thing to dispel. A PhD is not necessarily right for everyone, nor is it the right way to do um, some of these things if you are interested in them. And so it's good to make sure that it's the right fit for you. So one of the things that gets asked is about financing a PhD, and we're not going to go into the nitty gritty details, but just going over some of the myths and facts of it. Um, a myth is that getting a PhD is too expensive. And while PhDs can be very expensive if you don't have funding, in general, most PhD students get stipends and do not pay tuition. Um, usually, though, those stipends require doing some sort of assistantship, um, whether that be research or teaching um, for professors um, at the university that you go to. So it's not too expensive, and largely you end up getting at least a small stipend that you can live off of. Um, while most people are not making a lot of money during their PhD studies, they can at least live. Another myth that comes across is that foreigners cannot get funding. Um, foreigners, like most domestic students, are funded on these same stipend programs. Uh, I don't know. They get the same opportunities to apply for these programs at their universities. They might not, we all might not get the same funding opportunities depending on where you're from if you're applying for extra grants or extra research money, but a lot of these stipends and within department teaching assistantships and research positions um, are applicable to foreigners um, as well as domestic students in many of these countries. Um, a brief overview of the actual experience of getting a PhD. One of the facts is, is that research is the goal. So as a PhD student, you're looking for a university that has research that you're passionate about uh, and that you're a that your eventual goal is to produce a body of research to know more about a subject than you're to become an expert. And so you want to have that sort of passion about research and interest in a subject that you might be spending, um, in some cases, three, four, five, and in very few cases, seven or eight years studying continuously uh, during your PhD process. The experience of a PhD, 
there you'll have a lot and um, some of my colleagues are actually going to talk about this location matters. Uh, it might not matter as much the prestige. So, you know, there might be some big names out there. You might get into some big names, but be careful about the location. Make sure that it's somewhere that you're going to want to live. You have a life outside of research. And so if the location that you're in doesn't provide you um, this sort of maybe lifestyle or the things that you're going to want to do in the experience, it can be really hard with the PhD because you're you're in this place and so you're not doing research all the time and you need an outlet to express yourself, you need a chance to socialize. And so making sure that wherever you choose not only matters for the university itself, but also the location that the university is in. As well as the department and who you work with matters. Uh, you need someone who can help you with networking and professional connections, as well as working with um, professors and researchers who provide opportunities to you. And so those are important things to talk to um, in the professors of any university that you're interested in going to is what kind of opportunities you can have. Are they going to introduce you to people at conferences? Do professors at the university even go to conferences? Uh, and then what kind of research opportunities are available to you? So are there opportunities to do RA ships, um, both paid and maybe um, unpaid in order to get um, publishing opportunities? Are there opportunities, are there research think tanks on campus and things like that that you can work with? And so these are questions you want to ask about the location to make sure that not just like the name of the university, but the location itself is going to fit both your lifestyle as well as your research goals. A big myth is that once you are in a PhD program, you will earn a PhD. Uh, there are a lot of components to doing a PhD from starting with coursework. Um, this is outlining the sort of US style um, approach to universities and uh, to PhDs. And so you'll start with coursework for two to three years, then you'll take comprehensive exams, then you're going to you write your prospectus, then you're going to defend that prospectus, then you're going to do research on your dissertation, and then finally finish that dissertation. And so particularly in the US, there's a lot of different requirements and hoops to jump through as you go through the system that can prevent you or that might lead you to leaving a program or maybe not finishing your PhD. It's good to know that going in is sort of what is going to require what sort of complete what things you're going to have to do so no matter where in the world you choose knowing what the requirements are are an important part of knowing how and how fast you can get to that phd will it be possible what the sort of timeline you're looking at so that's an important part about like where you want to do it and knowing all the hoops you're going to jump through because once you're in doesn't necessarily mean you will earn that PhD, but you have to make sure that you do all the things that are required of you. However, a fact is, is that most graduate students are satisfied that they are pursuing a PhD. Um, this was a poll from Nature last year on a PhD survey, and what they found is, is that why students pursue PhDs for different reasons. Some might like to see some improvements in their PhD programs from their respondents. They found that most people are satisfied, very satisfied or somewhat satisfied with their decision to pursue a PhD. So most people are not going into it and then hating the fact that they're pursuing a PhD. They're actually satisfied that they are doing it. And if you're interested in more information on that, um, there's a link um, in the PowerPoint. So you have the experience. What do you do with a PhD afterwards? Well, there are some options. Um, but one of the misses is that a PhD will get you more money. Um, I don't know how many of you think that researchers make more money, uh, but the fact is, is that PhD programs really train you to become a researcher. They're not going to be big money um, opportunities once you get your PhD. Largely, you're going for the intellectual award over the monetary award. And you may eventually get to the point in some cases where you can get some financial reward, but 
you need to concentrate on the intellectual reward first before the financial reward. And another fact that a lot of PhD students need to face now is that they may not become a professor. So pursuing a PhD may not necessarily mean that you're going to end up in a professor position. A lot of PhDs towards the end of their career have to decide whether to teach or not to teach because only about 30% of PhD students end up in tenure track jobs. So actually getting a professor position. But PhDs largely don't have very low unemployment rates. Um, they often go on to get jobs in government, NGOs, or in the private sector. So the tenure track academia may not be the, is not the only place a PhD can end up. Uh, and finally, we're going to now talk about applying for PhD programs. Uh, so, one of the biggest myths is that the GPA and GRE are the most important part of the PhD application process. And the truth is not really. Um, they are, it's largely a two-step selection process. Largely you'll see things like um, your GPA, your GRE, and your TOEFL scores weed out from a large group to a smaller group that they look at individually. But this is why it's important to focus on your writing samples, your personal statements, your letters of recommendation, the courses that you take, publications and research opportunities that you took, and conferences, because to get that acceptance to those universities, it's really going to come down to who has the best of all of those parts of their application. Uh, another big myth is that you need a master's degree. Now, there are programs that do require a master's degree, but most PhD programs, particularly in the United States, do not require a master's before you go into them. But a lot of international programs do, so it's important to know where you're applying. So going back to that location matters thing, knowing what location you're applying for and what the requirements are can differ massively depending on the types of um, universities that you're going for. Uh, in a lot of the US programs, you actually get a master's in passing. So as you do your PhD, you also get a master's degree. Uh, in some international programs, you're actually required to have a master's degree before you begin. Another big myth, especially in your application process, is that professors will always write a good letter of recommendation. But remember, your professors are going to be honest. Um, they're going to base their letters of recommendation on objective grades and subjective knowledge of you as a person. So you know, how are you in the classroom? Do you discuss? Do you come to office hours? Do you talk to the professor? And does the professor know you? The better you know, you get to know your professors and they get to know you who write your recommendation letters, the better those recommendation letters are going to be. So not only do you want to be a good student, but you want to build a good relationship. You want to work with those professors so they can speak to the qualities that will make you a good researcher and a good PhD student. Finally, when it comes to applying to uh, universities, one of the biggest myths is if you can't go to the best, don't go at all. Um, there are many schools around the world who are not considered the top quality schools that offer a quality education that have good programs and that have professors who are very good at what they do and have the network connections and research opportunities that will provide you the the things that you need to be an accomplished PhD student to finish your dissertation and to be successful in whatever job or career you pursue afterwards. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if you go to the best uh, that it's going to be that you're going to be the best and or that you can even get into the best. But there's a lot of schools out there that you can get a good education, you can get a wide range of research experience that will let you be competitive and that will allow you to get jobs. So now I'm going to hand it over to my colleagues um, that will first talk about the US PhD system. So. Hi, Hi everybody. I'm Matt Millard. Um, Professor Nathie, if I could just ask, like, if you could go to the next slide, I guess, since you're kind of uh, controlling this, um, I, I can speak from there. 
Um, but I'm, I'm Matt Millard. Um, I got my PhD at the University of Alabama in the US. Um, taught it, or well, taught at one school aside from where I got my PhD at in the US and then uh, did a postdoc in the US. So as was kind of echoed earlier, um, it takes a while to get a PhD. The average time to get a PhD in political science in the US is six and a half years. But keep in mind that distinction with some other countries, right, where um, you have to first get your master's beforehand and then you go on to get your PhD. It, it, it ends up being about the same uh, amount of time. However, there are certain schools that tend to be longer. A statistic that I remember from several years ago is that the longest uh, one in the United States is at the University of Chicago. Um, and that's because their political scientists are doing something different. And that takes um, an average of nine years, which is considerably longer than the others. Um, but keep in mind, um, like I said, that the MA is kind of, or as Professor Neefe said earlier as well, the MA is virtually built in uh, to the PhD in the United States. And along the way, you can kind of, uh, you know, if you quit the PhD program, but you finish comprehensive exams, you get an MA kind of along the way. Um, so um, the next thing to talk about is funding. As was mentioned earlier, virtually all of your um, schooling is paid for. Um, I've heard of people like going, getting, getting their PhDs in the US in political science and having to pay for it. I've never met one of these people um, because almost everyone, it gets funded. There are occasionally offers that get thrown out to students like, hey, we'll take you, but we don't have funding. Um, that you're usually funded. And that generally means um, that you're, you, of course, you're funded, but you also get paid a small amount, as was mentioned earlier. On the low end, that can be probably around $15,000 a year for a stipend on the low end, up to the high end of about $50,000 or so. But keep in mind, that sounds like a lot of money. That's also in places like New York City, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, places that are incredibly expensive to live in. Um, so you do get that stipend along the way. But the, you also have a few more costs in the US that you don't have maybe elsewhere, like healthcare, right? Healthcare is health insurance you largely have to buy um, on your own at PhD programs because of a ruling by the tax authorities in the US. Um, so, uh, um, but of course, in order to get funding, you have to do something for them in return. And this generally is you're a teaching assistant or you can be a research assistant. Now that varies by each school that um, is out there. In some cases, um, you might TA the entire time, right? Like you just grade for a professor, maybe you, um, you know, kind of pitch hit for him or her when um, uh, they are gone to a conference or something. Uh, in some schools you teach more. For instance, like when I was in under, or, uh, doing my PhD, I think I taught seven classes before um, I left the program, which is a lot of classes to teach actually. Um, uh, but of course, you can also be a research assistant. And those tend to be a little bit more rare, depending on the school and the funding. And it's relatively rare that you get one of those the first year, maybe the second year or third year, it becomes more common. Um, but I think we also need to talk a little bit about um, the selection for the US schools. I think as uh, Professor Neefe illustrated earlier, it's kind of a two-step process, right? So long as you have like a, a minimum threshold for grades or you know, GRE, which is gonna look different this year, right? Because of the pandemic, some schools aren't taking them or requiring them this year. Um, from there, they weed down and send it to the department and there's often a committee who will kind of go through and figure out who it is that they want. Um, and in that respect, it's a little bit different from other countries where you maybe already have a master's going into the program um, and you're going to be working more exclusively with a single faculty member. That faculty member tends to have a little bit more say so. Uh, that being said, you know, um, do your research on places that you're applying to and you're interested in. Um, do, do the groundwork, right? The intelligence work of who's there, who could I work with, um, and what kind of research could I do with them? Um, so the timeline usually looks like this, as was mentioned earlier. The first two to three years are generally coursework, right? Um, your first semester is pretty much set in stone. You're going to take research design, you're going to take methods classes, almost always quantitative methods, and then sometimes qualitative methods on top of that. And sometimes you might even throw another methods class in there. And you might get like an, an elective or two kind of on your primary field. And then once second semester comes around, you have, you know, maybe less required courses and you start doing more things that are pertinent to uh, the subfield that you choose. 
And then after that, um, you take comp what's called comprehensive exams, certainly uh, kind of by the end of the third year. And this can vary whether or not you come in with a master's degree or not and how much of that counts towards your co coursework. Um, and then after comprehensive exams, you begin your dissertation and you write your prospectus uh, and then ultimately defend your dissertation. And that can take, you know, two to three years, really depending on how far advanced or ahead of the game you are, right? So if you come in knowing exactly what PH or like what you want to write your dissertation on, you'll get out quickly. Um, that's not always the case and that's fine and you can change your dissertation. A lot of people uh, do, right? They get convinced into doing something else. Um, and it also can kind of be based off your advisor, right? Um, and they'll kind of push you in different directions. And then ultimately you defend that dissertation uh, and you generally don't defend it until you have a job in hand or at least some kind of offer. That's not always the case and that can vary by school. Um, but there's also different subfields that you choose within the U.S. Um, most schools, you're, of course, required to have one subfield, uh, and I'd say most, you probably still have two. Uh, in some schools, you still have, or you might still have three. Um, and those subfields, but you might only test in two. And those uh, subfields generally are American politics, comparative politics, international relations, uh, political theory, methods which can be more quant oriented or qualitative oriented it tends to slant i think at least if someone's studying methods itself tends to slant in the u.s more towards quantitative um, and then of course public policy which that can vary based off the school you're at if you're in the political science department and there's a separate public policy school well they're probably not going to offer a phd in public policy or with a subfield of public policy um, in the political science department so that can vary a little bit and then, of course, there's different areas within each of those disciplines that you're uh, really going to be looking at. Um, and certain schools tend to be, for lack of a better way to say it, quote, unquote, better in certain things, right? Um, I think, as uh, Professor Nephew showed earlier on a slide, um, if you want to do methods, yeah, you're, you don't want to go to somewhere like the University of Chicago. They're not known for that, right? They're known uh, for different things, for other things that are equally important. By the same token, you wouldn't want to go do um, political theory at somewhere like um, the University of Rochester because they're known for methods, right? They're known for statistics. Um, you know, great schools, both of them, they just do different things. And I think that's why school or why you need to choose a school that fits well for you. Um, if you could please go to the next slide. I have uh, some uh, information up there as well. Um, choose the one that's a good fit, right? The one that you like. Um, there are certain programs that, you know, I've heard people talk about and I've heard rumors from faculty members and from fellow graduate students. They're, they're might be big programs and a lot of students and you know great professors there but they just they don't work well for their students right and if you have those massive programs you tend to get lost kind of in the crowd um, and I, I know exactly the school that I'm thinking of right now but I'm not going to mention it um, and so it's really a balance about what fits for you right a geographic location people are doing interesting things that you like uh, you know maybe a good school um, doesn't have to be the best, right? Um, and that brings me to the last point. Don't be, quote unquote, a ranking slave, right? Is there a difference between number five and number eight or nine? No, not really. Is there a difference between five and number 50? Yeah, probably. But the point is, is choose one that works well for you. Choose one that fits for you and have an end in mind, right? Do you want to go into academia? Do you want to go work for Facebook or Google or for the government or whatever, right? And try to link up what you're doing throughout your career there with what you want your career outcome to be. And that really applies for all of these programs, no matter where in the world you want to go. It's just thinking strategically about where you want to be when you get finished. That doesn't mean you can't change uh, your plans along the way, but I think that's just an important way to keep all of that in perspective. Um, and down here, I have some uh, links to some different websites, APSA, American Political Science Association. Um, and I believe the second link here is um, a link kind of explaining data in the discipline, like where do people get employment at, what, are, what subfields are they choosing, et cetera. Um, and another one, um, you know, that I'm bias towards since I do international relations is isanet.org, that's International Studies Association. 
um, if you're interested in either of those, you know, check out the links. Um, and then the last one is um, uh, institutions granting PhDs in political science in the US. I think it's only the US. Um, I can't remember. I'm almost positive it's only the US. Um, aside from that, you know, if you have any more questions, you know, please feel free to ask here towards the end. Right, we have someone who's going to speak on European PhDs. Do we have slides and I can stop sharing? Uh, no, you, I don't have slides. So okay. I, just five minutes. So I, I can, um, I think you two covered a lot of uh, good um, topics already regarding um, busting some of the myths about PhD programs and um, maybe some of those um, would be encouraging remarks, some of would be discouraging, but I think it's good to have a comprehensive idea of what um, awaits students when they get into a PhD program, and I will focus on the uh, European PhD option. So I, I don't need, a, I think, an introduction because judging by the participants, I know all of the students. So hello, everybody, and I'm really glad to see this amazing uh, um, Facebook of, of uh, great students at our department. So I had no doubt that I will see the names that I'm seeing. I hope that um, the GRE tests uh, have been um, good for you, all of you guys. And I hope that you have been preparing and working on your statement of purpose. And, and I wish you best of luck with your PhD application process. Um, so um, here's some of the advice that I have about pursuing a PhD in Europe. Um, let me start with um, making a comment about the qualifications. So unlike the US, you would need a master's qualification to apply for a PhD programs. And, um, and I say this is very important because um, getting into a good uh, master programs um, in Europe would actually help you create a solid PhD proposal. Uh, so I say this is the time when you discover what you want to work on as a PhD topic. So getting into a good MA program, in my opinion, in Europe is more important than anything else. So once you get into a good MA program, you might actually meet your potential PhD supervisor during that program. Uh, and make sure that you make a distinction between research intensive MA program and ones that is more policy oriented research but professional oriented uh, master program. So you don't tend to do a master in public policy or master in, in a graduate school of, um, I don't know, business. If you want to pursue a PhD in political science, kind of you need a master in political science to, um, which is research intensive so that you get the necessarily methodological uh, background to pursue a PhD. Because European PhDs do not have great deal of coursework. They have limited coursework. Um, but uh, in itself, they are not as long as the US PhD because they presuppose that you have done a, a solid MA before. And during the MA program, this is the time when you would uh, get a good background in, in methodology and in the topic that you want to work on. And, um, and then um, once you get your master, and I really strongly encourage you to apply to a good MA program because there are some better MA programs than others, um, and some that are fit for pursuing a PhD in political science and some that are not. So if you don't plan to do a PhD in political science, you don't need to do an MA in political science. MA in political science is useless unless you pursue a PhD in political science, uh, at least in Europe. So um, you would have three years to four years to pursue your PhD. And when you apply for a PhD program in Europe, you apply with a PhD proposal already. So the application process is very different. You don't apply into a department, into a PhD departmental program. You apply with a professor that actually already has the, the funding for you. So usually it's, it's tied, the proposal would be tied to the research of the professor you are taking as a supervisor often. Um, so um, as part of uh, the application, you really need to create a good uh, research proposal. Um, and there are some uh, exception to this stance in the UK because there is this push for uh, creating a lot more PhD programs across the board in the UK. So there are um, enrollment rates in PhD programs in UK have skyrocketed. If there were a couple of PhD per departments per year, students now we have um, double digit numbers, which is uh, pressure for, it comes because of other issues, we don't need to discuss those. So uh, now there are more PhD um, 
uh, PhD applications that are tied to our department, but um, usually most of the time you would apply with a specific topic with already very developed research proposal and you would specify and you would know your supervisor already. So getting the approval prior to application is kind of needed so that you get, maximize your chances of getting funding and accept it. Um, and then you will have, you kind of start working straight on your proposal right away. So the coursework is not like in the US. Um, because you are supposed to get a master's degree before, uh, you have some minimal coursework, but most of it, they expect you to start working on your research right away. Um, this is uh, not a fundamental difference. Um, so another difference that I want to mention is the teaching requirement. It happens that in case those of you who want to stay in academia, you would need to have a teaching experience. And in U Europe, you can end up not having that teaching experience at all because you are paid by external grant uh, that a professor usually has or, or maybe even departmental funding. Um, you uh, are not required to teach. So in US, I think a lot of uh, scholarships um, are there strings attached that you should need to do some TA work as part of your grant, not in Europe. In Europe, you have a different contract. You have full-time employment contract. Um, this is the innovation of the Bologna process that requires OPG students to be full-time employees of the, of the university. And you have that money as part of your research project, not for your teaching duties. So make sure you, um, you inquire early on about teaching opportunities at a department, which would be separately paid. You would be paid per hour for the teaching duties. But there are, um, if you get into a good uh, PhD program in the UK, um, you will be able to teach at many other universities, teaching assistants, they will hire you. Uh, so there would be opportunities, but you have to press on that. Um, if you want to stay in academia, I think um, getting some teaching experience, at least minimal during these three, four years of your uh, course of your PhD program is important. Um, funding is easy. It's very easy. Um, I mean, um, you apply already to uh, research. The, you would see in Europe, there are a lot of calls already for PhD application on very specific topics. So professors that have ERC grants or many other national grants, they will uh, have lines of that grant financing couple of PhD students, and they want to work with PhD students on that specific topic. So the topics would be very specific. It would be, let's say, trade related and this part of trade or whatever. And then you you will need to come up with your own PhD proposal with that within that topic. So um, funding is, is abundant. I think uh, if you want to pursue a PhD, there is a lot of money um, out there. So you in, in Europe, it's a very different story. There are also national uh, public funding at, uh, depending on the country where you're applying. So like Netherlands has different funding line than Belgium, then France, then Germany, then UK. So all of them have their own national uh, bodies, uh, grant awarding bodies. And then there is the European level, Erasmus Plus, and under ERC grants, there are a lot of uh, PhD uh, st students funded, but also there is the Erasmus PhD programs, and those are also uh, project specific. So um, you would apply between a project, uh, but you need to come up with a, a research proposal. Um, so this would be the, the difference um, with pursuing a PhD in Europe, I think the essence of the difference. But um, my advice would be to understand that this is a, a long term project. So this is not an easy task. Uh, so make sure you love whatever you're doing. So make sure you have passion about the topic and make sure that you are ready to commit a couple of years of your life to this project. And, and uh, you are in that not for the money, um, you're in it for um, the fact that you are uh, capable of um, delaying gratification, right? Like, uh, like all graduate students, um, that you would have to be very committed and work hard to, to bring this uh, project to fruition. So that would be um, all from my side. Okay, next we have Canadian PhDs. Um, hi, thank you, Jessica. First, I want to confirm, can you all hear me? Because I'm on a new computer. I've not used the mic before. Yes. Okay, 
Great. All right. Um, let me share my screen then. And Jessica, you will need to enable participant screen sharing for me to be able to do that. Or maybe just add me as a, as a co-host. Yep, that seems to be uh, possible now. Okay. All right, here we go. Let me just see if I can... I guess that's uh, what it's going to look like. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right. Um, so, hi, everyone. I, I don't think I know any of the students in the audience, so I guess I might as well uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm Carol Truba, and uh, my qualification for doing this is that I did my PhD at the University of Toronto, and also, I guess, uh, the fact that I started my PhD relatively recently, which means I still vaguely remember the application process. So the two topics that I'm going to talk about today is a applying for and doing PhD in Canada, and then I'm going to segue from that uh, to a discussion of the application process more broadly. Um, I'll start talking about the Canadian education system. Uh, which is much smaller than the other ones that we've discussed and so probably much uh, less known. Um, but it's also this curious mixture of random elements of the US and the UK systems. Although for most practical purposes, the structure of PhD programs is similar to those in the US. So you first take your classes, typically for around two years, and then gradually start working on your own project on your dissertation, which takes up the remainder of your degree. Uh, that said, there are some important differences between universities, uh, which we can, for our purposes, classify or divide into two broad categories. So first you have the big three, uh, and oligopoly is the name of the game in Canada, so no wonder it's found in education as well. Uh, so these are massive, better, own univer better known universities with the most funding, with the largest departments, including the largest political science departments, and the largest PhD cohorts. And these three universities are McGill University, uh, the University of British Columbia, and the University of Toronto, or U of T. And these provide a mostly American-like experience for the PhD students. Uh, they come with very large cohorts, so uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, almost 30 students uh, get admitted into the PhD program every year. Uh, training uh, tends to be more formal, US style, uh, so with classes, but also often with more competition for faculty time and for funding. Although at the same time, because these are big and quite rich universities, uh, there's more pots of funding that are likely to be available uh, at places like this, even if it takes extra effort to locate them. And then there is the rest. Um, small universities with small departments, fewer faculty, um, sometimes less availability of PhD level classes uh, in those first few years, uh, or sometimes PhD classes run jointly with uh, master's level cl classes. And training in those universities may approximate the UK model a little bit more, so with shorter intended duration of the programs and funding, and correspondingly less class time and less time devoted to, uh, or more time devoted to PhD research. Um, smaller universities are also more likely to have specific specialties. So for example, York University in Toronto is well known for uh, faculty interest in post-coloniality and post-modern things more generally. Uh, so if you're interested in this kind of thing and want to be in North America, um, some universities in Canada tend to be more Welcoming, welcoming to more heterodox approaches uh, than those in the US. Although, and this is um, important to note, this doesn't apply to the big three, which generally do stay in the mainstream of political science, even if they are sometimes a bit more receptive to things such as uh, qualitative uh, research that will be the case in the US. Um, the small universities, while they may have such interesting 
idiosyncratic uh, specialties, they also have may also have few faculty that study anything that you may be interested uh, interested in. Um, and that may be a problem because you don't want to rely too much on a single faculty member. Uh, so for example, you may want to consider applying to UDM, uh, the University of Montreal, uh, if you are interested in electoral behavior because Andre Blay is the man uh, for you know, anyone studying electoral behavior. Uh, but other than that, you're probably better off going somewhere. And of course, the risk is that if you're depending on working with one faculty member and that person uh, retires, leaves, or dies, then you're in a bit of a pickle. And if you're in a big department, there are likely to be some other faculty you can turn to if you need to. Um, on the other hand, if you end up being the one PhD student that somebody uh, supervises, you can develop a closer relationship with that faculty member. Uh, there will be the uh, possible in a big department, uh, can have more access to your advisor and their time and crucially to their funding. As for the actual application process, things tend to be quite similar to what happens in the US. Uh, so um, you have general statements of intent, writing samples, three or four letters of reference, CVs, transcripts. Uh, deadlines uh, for most universities tend to be in January, which is a few weeks after the American schools. Uh, Unlike in Europe, there is often no expectation of contact with potential advisors uh, before you submit your application, uh, certainly not in the really big programs where uh, for the first few years you'll be doing classes anyway. Uh, but it may always be a good idea to get in touch with someone and uh, uh, see if they are interested in working with you on the project that you are potentially interested in doing. And, uh, you know, if someone is patently uninterested in your proposal or seems like a jerk, you're probably better off going somewhere else anyway. Um, compared to the US, more, but by no means all people starting PhDs in Canada tend to already have master's degrees. Uh, but then master's graduates are becoming increasingly common in the US, uh, grad schools as well. Uh, so that may be a bit of a wash, but you are likely to be competing for admission against people who already have master's degrees. Uh, um, like most universities, uh, both in Europe and the US, uh, Canadian universities charge application fees. Uh, um, those tend to be in the like a little over 100 Canadian dollars, so uh, in the range of 40 to 50 uh, or 60,000 tenge or so uh, per application. Um, speaking of costs, and this has already been covered in one way or another, but um, I think it's worth repeating and putting it in the context of uh, the Canadian academia. Uh, so any decent university in Canada or anywhere else will fully cover tuition for the duration of the program and provide you with a live-in stipend, uh, some of which may be in the form of research or teaching assistantship. Uh, and you should never even consider going to uh, a school that does not offer you a full ride. Um, but pay attention to the official duration of funding as compared to the usual time to completion. So, for example, in my programs, we are guaranteed five years of full funding, but the usual time to completion at the University of Toronto is seven to eight years. Uh, and uh, uh, at the University of Toronto, non policy departments often had it a lot worse. Um, also check the uh, UBC website, so both UBC and U of T guarantee five years of funding. I couldn't find any info on the McGill website, but the chances are that it is the same. But other than small universities, they may only guarantee you four years, which may not be nearly enough uh, for you to finish your PhD. Um, that said, official funding that you receive from the university uh, only really provides you with like poverty level standard of living. Uh, to actually afford to live in the very expensive Canada, you need more funding. Um, um, 
So, and in Canada, you're not eligible for most government PhD grants if you're not Canadian. The few grants that are available to international students are certainly very much worth applying for, but they tend to be very competitive as well. Uh, I applied for a bunch of them, I never got any. Um, on the other hand, because I was at a big and fairly rich university, I was able to secure a pretty substantial amount of money for living expenses and research from various pots of money available there. So it's always important to be on the lookout for more funding that you can secure in various ways. Um, and it's certainly worth trying to find out from the graduate director of a PhD program before you make the decision to go and the grant director should give you a sense of the funding opportunities available. And finally, there is the um, opportunity cost, which is massive. And I don't want to say that the uh, experience cannot be rewarding, it very often is, it was certainly so that uh, for me, but also you spend several years of your life working very hard on something nobody else probably cares about very much um, and get paid very little for it. Uh, while at the same time, you could be, you know, raking big bucks at uh, Google or McKinsey, even though that might come at the, you know, cost of them suck it, uh, sucking it, or like getting your soul sucked out, out of you. Um, and if you decide to do a PhD in Canada or anywhere, well, anywhere else, you need to be very clear about why you're doing it and what you are planning to get out of it. Um, and if it is an academic job, keep in mind that A, there is almost no academic jobs available anywhere, and B, Canadian PhD graduates job market prospects are probably even worse than those of their American counterparts, which in many universities are pretty bad uh, anyway. Um, and this is largely simply because the Canadian uh, academic job market is very small and because self-respecting departments don't hire their own PhDs, uh, if you do a PhD at one of them, you are automatically not uh, eligible for something like 15 to 20 percent of all jobs available in the market. Um, and of course, people find jobs in the US, Europe and elsewhere, including here, I'm like we have three uh, Canadian PhDs uh, in our department. Um, but while the academic job market is relatively open as labor markets go, there are still considerable barriers to entry. And a US job is more likely to go someone with a US PhD and a UK job, someone with a PhD from the UK and so on. Um, and as a result, Canadian, Canadian department's job market performance tends to be quite disappointing. Uh, so I started my PhD in 2013, and from my cohort of almost 30 PhD students, uh, I believe I'm the only one with a full-time tenure track or equivalent uh, position. Uh, the cohort above me, I believe only two people secured tenure track jobs. And that was before the pandemic hit and eliminated uh, all the jobs that used to to be there and those jobs might return at some point uh, in the next few years or not. Um, and the, this is of course if you're hoping to get a full-time academic job and needless to say most people uh, pursue other opportunities. Uh, uh, you know they work for the government, for NGOs and cons consulting and some of those can be really great jobs. Uh, so I know a McGill PhD who first got a tenure drug job in Texas hated it and left after a few years for a full-time staffer position at UNICEF, which sounds like a really great gig. Uh, but the big question remains, if you're interested in a job uh, like this, then do you really benefit from doing a PhD? And quite possibly not, and you're better off doing a master's and then getting a hand, hands-on work experience instead of spending a few years in ivory tower. Now here is a little secret that was uh, briefly referred to by uh, uh, some other faculty. A uh, little secret that grad schools don't necessarily want you to know. So your PhD often comes with a free master's degree if you gain it, admission into the PhD program without first having one. Uh, so your PhD is fully funded on a decent university uh, and after you finish your coursework in the first two years you are eligible for a master's degree and this is the case in Canada, Canada much like it is in the US uh, with a slight twist that uh, unlike in the US where 
uh, many, many universities, all students automatically get a master's degree on their way to the PhD. Uh, in Canada, it doesn't happen so automatically, but you can still get a free master's program, uh, sorry, a free master's degree uh, if you are so inclined, if you gain admission into a PhD program. All right, and finally, um, we have the application process. And here I'll be very brief because I think that most things that I have to say are pretty uh, commonsensical and uh, you probably already know this quite well. Um, so once you've decided on the schools you're interested in, um, find it, found the deadlines, uh, which will mostly be in December in the US, January in Canada, and at various points uh, in Europe, then you'll need to start preparing your documents, uh, the documents that I listed a few minutes ago. Um, and then just start, start working backwards from that, from that deadline and make sure you start working on the documents uh, with giving yourself a few months to spare to make sure that you can get everything done on time. This is, isn't necessarily because the process is so time consuming, uh, rather because it has a few moving parts and you will be relying on other people to help you along the process and also with all that you don't want to stress uh, unnecessarily. Um, so you will need reference letters, usually three, sometimes four at Canadian schools. Uh, make sure you give the letter writers enough time to write you a good letter. Uh, so you should ask for letter at the very least two weeks in advance, but you know, we're busy people and our lives will be a lot easier if we are given more notice than that and preferably quite a bit more notice than that. Um, and also make sure that the faculty you ask know what to write. So it's best to approach faculty who already know you and your strengths well, but if there is some relevant information that your letter writers may not know, you should provide it to us. Uh, like we may not know that you won some award, but mentioning it can help to make the letter stronger. Um, and you also have all those other documents that you will need to prepare and do so early and workshop them, workshop them. So share them with others, ask others to comment and offer suggestions for improvement. And like with all writing, revisions help to make work better and you want your documents to be as good as possible. Um, realistically, since you need others input, you should give them time to review your work uh, uh, and you know uh, you'll probably prepare the most challenging documents your statement of intent or your writing uh, samples first and then make sure you have enough time to let them go through a few rounds of re revision in response to feedback to make them as good as you really need them to be. Uh, if you need to do a GRE or some other tests, also do it early so that if you don't do very well, uh, you can redo it. One thing I didn't mention in reference to Canadian universities is that a lot of universities do not require GREs. And it seems that while universities require English proficiency tests, you guys are exempted from those by virtue of being enrolled at, an, at a at university where English is language of instruction. Um, and then finally, make sure you submit the application on time. And uh, then once that's done, take a breath and relax and wait and see what schools school you get into. And if you really, really know that you want to do a PhD, then go to the best grad school that you, uh, that you get in. And that's it for me. All right, now we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, you can ask questions if you have questions about any of these different universities from these different areas. Um, Professor Neil Collins is also here who can answer questions on Irish universities 
as well as about programs here at Nazarbayev. Uh, so if anyone would like to ask questions, they are welcome to unmute themselves or ask questions within the chat and we can um, ask them and have someone on the panel answer. So you're welcome to ask at any time. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your presentation. Oh, can you be closer to the mic? Um, I wanted to ask about the agency. Can you hear me? Uh, you're too far away. We can't hear you. Maybe you like it in that chat. Or uh, perhaps even write it in uh, the chat function. Oh, there we go. So the question is knowing our thoughts about PhDs and grad students in Asia, in grad schools in Asia. Yeah, that's a good question. I think we have uh, maybe two or four. Um, you could answer it. It's, hey, so I'm just about Korea. Yeah? Yeah, even though I also did my PhD in the United States, but just because I'm from Korea, <laughs> so and uh, could you be a little bit more specific about uh, about the about what you know about the the uh, PhD program in Asia or more specifically South Korea? Uh, I asked the question uh, to Aim, and so, and this is not the question no. I want to answer to write. So. <laughs> um. so Aim said, it just mm. seems that they are not as prestigious as those in the U.S. and Europe. Mm, so that's so. So maybe. So, in most uh, in most <clears throat> Korean universities, uh, they uh, the the language of ed education is Korean. So, even though there are some uh, some in, uh, there are some graduate school of international studies where uh, where they need to educate the students in English, but um, in other cases, more. Uh, in almost all cases, you need to write your dissertation in Korean and. The language of education is also Korean, but uh, in terms of demand, then over the world, then most uh, international universities, uh, universities wants to hire a PhD uh, who is analyst a little bit fluent in English, and they need to uh, they need to teach in English, and they need to pub uh, publish papers written in English. So, uh, if you earn your PhD degree in South Korea, then uh, it is very likely that your uh, prospect for getting a job outside Korea is pretty limited. So maybe that is why um, there the opportunities for Korea, uh, the PhDs uh, in Korean universities are like some considered as less prestigious. Maybe because of their opportunities for uh, for job prospect or maybe um, in terms of their work or some publication records. So that could be one of the reasons. And, but I think personally, I think that uh, some uh, top universities in Korea uh, provide, uh, provide a pretty good education for PhDs. And, and there are a lot, of, a lot of professors who got a degree in Europe or United States and Canada, so 
they can also provide you with a good opportunity to learn something and also do your own research depending on your research interests. So, but the reason, but I think if just in terms of purely um, job prospect, uh, job prospect or job op opportunities, then I think it would be better for you to uh, to pursue uh, your PhD degree in uh, United States or Canada or uh, European universities. That is just my personal opinion. All right, the next question, are there enough opportunities to pursue a PhD degree in continental Europe in English? I can jump on that one. Um, so there are indeed a lot of uh, continental European universities that uh, have uh, English as their uh, working language and many of the graduate programs at master level and at a PhD level. So I think Netherlands is the leader. Uh, they have a lot of MA and even fully set up undergraduate programs in English. And then Lund University in Sweden offers that. Um, uh, in Germany, I think there was in the hard sciences in STEM, many universities offer it, like uh, Bremen University does it. Maybe not uh, the Berlin ones, but uh, maybe the Hertie School of Government does it also in English. So you need to really to check everything, like Science Po in Paris does it. Um, so there are indeed places, CEU in Budapest, so there are places where you can pursue uh, your uh, PhDs in English. Um, so PhD, it's already way easier, like um, Belgium has it at a lot of Flemish universities. So I say that um, Northern Europe, Scandinavia are very open. So there are so many programs already, a master's program, so a lot of coursework is fully taught in English. Um, but um, PhD programs that have little coursework where you actually work with your supervisor and um, definitely you can write it in, in, uh, in English. So I know a few colleagues who finished in, in um, even in France, uh, PhDs in English, where usually they were the most uh, um, jealously guarding the priority of uh, finishing writing your dissertation in French, but they actually allowed English submission. So I have a few friends there in Switzerland as well. So the Graduate Institute in Geneva has fully English speaking PhDs. The European University Institute in Florence exclusively in English. So uh, many places. Now, yeah, so the problem is there that the teaching part would be maybe if you are teaching undergraduate classes, then you have to teach in French or in Italian. So if you go to uh, these places, unless you go to a fully English speaking university like Louis in, in Italy, in Rome, they have even undergraduate classes taught in English. So um, you have to work on that, on the, the teaching side. So it's always, you're always encouraged to learn the local language, of course. Next question we have is whether you need to have a topic before you start your PhD program. I, I think that can largely vary by, you know, where you end up going to school at. Of course, in the more European setting, you need it. Um, but, you know, just kind of uh, as kind of uh, background, uh, one of the guys I graduated with in my cohort, he actually, he came in with, um, I believe, a master's in social work. I came in with a master's. Um, in political science, it, we, you didn't need a graduate degree, right, coming in. He finished his PhD from uh, before me because literally he knew on day one what he wanted to do, and it actually it was great timing. I think he got his uh, tenure track job like a year, year ago or something, and it was on police violence and uh, race issues in the United States, like literally talk about perfect timing. Um, he's been all over the news lately. He got appointed by a governor in a state to be on a commission regarding police violence, so it, it really varies, it, at least in the US, you don't have to have one, but it can certainly help um, maybe get your foot in the door if you think strategically about who you wanna work with while you're there, which I, I think as Professor Zuba mentioned earlier, um, don't paint yourself too much into a corner because that person could retire, go to a different school, die, you know, whatever along the ways. But in the US's case, it's certainly not a requirement. In Europe, definitely. Yes, in Europe, definitely, you need a PhD proposal, not just the topic. So this is extensive uh, piece of work that you will need to, to finish for good PhD programs, so. 
uh, even though that is not required, but I think if you have something, something specific, then uh, that will help you get admission. Pre I, I'm pretty sure about that. And if you have a, a research topic and research question and research agenda you want to continue to work on uh, in the PhD program, then that will also help you to, to reduce the amount of time or duration you need to stay in the PhD program. I would agree with that. It certainly won't hurt you, I don't think. I think we're going to talk about uh, cover letters sometime soon in the future, but uh, it's also uh, advice that you write uh, like who you're going to work with. Like you don't have to necessarily work with them, at least in the U.S. Uh, context, but you might want to write uh, who you want to work with and on what topic so that, you know, you can tell them that you are really interested in the school and you are uh, interested in the program, you know what they teach there, and that's the best fit for you. So if you, if you know, or you, you have to uh, sort of uh, let them know that you are interested in the program, right? Because that's how you uh, do it. And I think we'll talk that uh, in the future, so. Mm -hmm. Next question, at which year of studies do PhD students start working as teaching assistants in the United States? Uh, day one, right? I, I joke because they want free labor. Um, no, um, we started generally, um, at least at my school and my program, uh, you know, starting out as a teaching assistant. Um, I remember the first class I went to is political theory uh, class, and I would help him maybe grade, uh, you know, some of the short answer questions and then do attendance and do like kind of like stuff like putting things into Blackboard, which is a platform like Moodle, um, you know, posting tests, that sort of stuff. Um, our program required that you have, I think at least like a year on, on the, or you had to at least have like 18 hours, like a year and a half or something before you could actually teach a class. But in practice, it wasn't until, you know, at least like the second semester of year two when you had to teach. Um, and it wasn't required, right? And that was a more teaching extensive school, right? That, um, uh, there were a few people I know who didn't like teaching, right? So they managed to you know, talk their way back down to um, wanting to be a TA rather than teaching a class themselves. Um, not because, uh, you know, any particular reason, I just think, yeah, they didn't want to go into academia. So they thought, well, why am I wasting my time doing this when I could just be a TA? Um, whereas, you know, teaching experience does help you add some other things on your CV. Um, but you certainly wouldn't teach a class by yourself before really year two. Um, and in most cases, probably not until year three. Uh, can I add something? Uh, so in my uh, university, it was a bit different because uh, international students had to uh, appear in this test, English uh, language proficiency test, even though uh, you go through uh, GREs and TOEFL and all that. Even I had to be, even though I had uh, my degree from the US and I was an undergraduate teaching assistant, I had to wait for one semester because the test would be uh, halfway through the first semester. First semester, so I could only be a research assistant for the first semester like along with all international students. So only uh, from the US or English speaking country could uh, serve as uh, a teaching assistant, at least for the first semester. Then you could be either teaching assistant or depart, uh, a research assistant, depending on the need of the department. But you cannot, yeah. mm -hmm. or we could not teach uh, classes of our own uh, until we had uh, finished our comprehensive exam. So that would be uh, the third year, starting fourth year. That also was the with me, so. I was also an international student, so uh, if if we fail to pa fail to pass the test, the English proficiency test, then we are not allowed to work as a teaching assistant. So, all right. Next question: Do you recommend applying to a PhD degree straight out of university? I can jump in here. Um, so I think from like a career perspective it doesn't really matter and doesn't provide any benefits at all and especially that you are doing other things for you know the time between your uh, undergraduate degree or master's degree and the phd but a lot depends on your topic if you are interested in doing something that requires knowledge uh, of the places that you're interested in or uh, uh, proficiency in the language that you need to speak in order to conduct field work, then, then it might make
I think we just lost. Would anyone else like to speak on applying to a PhD degree straight out of university? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't mind jumping in for that because I'll answer the next question as well. So the next question is um, about doing a, a degree in public policy. Uh, so I made some inquiries about this because when I looked down the list of our um, students who applied over the years, quite a few have applied to uh, do masters and PhDs in public policy. And personally, I, I feel, you know, as sim since I'm the only one here from a, a country that uh, gained independence in the 20th century, like Kazakhstan, um, the, uh, I think that the opportunity to write about your country in English uh, and be the first person to, you know, present something on, an, uh, uh, on a public policy or an institution or what have you uh, is a great opportunity and a great service. It would be great, for any, I think, from NU's, NU's um, point of view, since part of our, you know, our mission is to uh, help Kazakhstan, then it would be a very good thing to do. But if you're going to the public policy route, there's a real bias uh, there for about having uh, experience outside of the university. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to stop being a student, but if you've, be, if you've taken an internship or you've volunteered with an NGO or you know, you've shown an interest in the model United Nations or you know, these sorts of things to show the, the public policy people you're applying to that you're actually interested in uh, policies and uh, you know, and, and events and being on top of the news. They really like that. They like the notion of uh, you knowing what the current issues in public policy are. So at the interview, they're likely to ask you, you know, what do you think about, you know, that kind of uh, thing. So I think, yes, it's, it's a bit of a specialist field, the public policy thing, but uh, uh, if you show you've, you've had a, an interest in public policies over a period of time, some experience, if you can, you can, that could be internships, whatever. It's definitely an advantage. I want to jump on on this question about uh, PhD in public policy. So um, I, I think that uh, public policy are great schools, so you should consider doing an, a master in that or even PhD. Now, I have heard from my friend's experience who has done PhD in public policy in the US that uh, he was an economist and he did a, a PhD in, uh, in a public policy school, and then he was biased against hiring in econ departments. So he couldn't get his foot in econ departments, so the job opportunities for him, he has successful academic career, but it is at, at a graduate school of public policy. So there is, uh, I don't know about political science, in case that there is a bias uh, against, in political science departments of hiring PhDs, not from political science, but from public policy, whether they would think that you cannot maybe cover intro classes or um, so you need to think about that. I think that there is a less bias uh, for us hiring uh, PhDs from public policy, but in certain departments, there are biases. I think that's probably a valid point. I've had some other people tell me that as well. And keep in mind, in some schools, at least in the context of the US, you know, if you're interested in public, like uh, policy, you can choose that as a subfield, right? If the school doesn't have its own separate public policy school. So like, um, say like Harvard, right? They've got a public policy department, but they also have political science, or I think they call it government yeah. or something like that. So it can vary from school to school. You can kind of do a mix and match. But actually, the, the graduate school of public policy are important schools. There are many Ivy Leagues have them and many and you has it, so um, you you still have a job opportunities. But I know that if you are doing, um, you you can take the political science kind of more econ orientation. So there are people coming in from these two backgrounds in the schools, and and then departments, uh, uh, conventional departments are biased against these PhDs. Often they're asking, why don't you have a PhD in economics or PhD in political science? So. I would also be careful about public policy schools and making sure that you read what they specialize in. So like at the university I went with, there was public policy, but they were more on the um, actually planning and 
So planning works and the more business and public planning part of public policy and less on the public policy as in politics side. And so they had only a few classes in policy, but a large number of classes that were um, centered around infrastructure building and um, policy implementation. So knowing what you're looking for in a public policy school, look at what kind of courses they offer, where their professors come from as well, because that can have an effect on jobs that you're looking for as well as the research that you're going to do and be able to do. Um, next question that we have is um, how should one approach the faculty they want to work with at a university um, before mentioning their names in their statements of purpose. So how do you talk to someone who you want to work with, who you want to do research with? Um, I can jump in because I have a student who I wrote letters for and he got admitted to many <laughs> PhD programs. And so um, he just finished a uh, new in spring. And uh, so first of all, he, uh, he, he liked some research, then he looked at the footnotes of the articles and books that he read. He liked certain theories or explanations or approaches of professors. So and those professors were alive. Uh, so he just found the, he googled the email addresses and he simply um, emailed, emailed them and I'm, they were very pleased to see that a student from Kazakhstan has read the articles or papers or research uh, products and uh, had some kind of comments to make about that. And uh, it was interesting. So they were very pleased. And none of those professors um, refused to talk to this uh, student. And then they had Skypes or um, like, yeah, Skypes uh, interviews and they talked more. And then he chose, he narrowed down the list of uh, PhD programs that he wanted to apply. So in, now right now, I think we live in this age of email communications and it's very fast uh, information exchange. So my advice would be um, to uh, read the articles or books or chapters by these professors, think about them. Uh, prepare a comment on them and then uh, email these professors and see if they are taking PhD students or if that what project they're working on now, because now they may be working on some other research projects and uh, see what they say, see how you, um, uh, how they talk to you. If you like, then you can continue and uh, mention their names in the statement uh, of purpose. Also look, you may also look at the PhD list at the university uh, that, you, that they are teaching at and see if they supervise any uh, international students. So if they supervise international students, well, uh, so then that's a plus. So they are more likely to take more international uh, PhD students. And, and don't get disappointed if they don't get back to you. Uh, oftentimes that happens, uh, right? Or not oftentimes, but sometimes that can happen. So I, I think that's that's normal. Yeah, that's fair. Oft, sometimes even advisors won't get back with their own students in a timely manner. So, you know, it's always weird cold emailing someone. Um, and yeah, I think it's always a good idea. But I think as Alexei said, do your homework beforehand and know what you're going to say to them or a ask of them. And of course, it matters in more contexts than in others. It probably matters less in the US than it certainly would in Europe or maybe even you could argue Canada. And I don't think it is required to contact them before mentioning that their names in your statement. But if things work, work out for you, then that would help you. But mm, there's no guarantee. That's right. So. I think it's useful to keep in mind that in most universities in the US and Canada, individual members of the department, individual faculty members are unlikely to see individual PhD applications. So it's great that you get in touch with someone and they may be interested in working with you, but they won't be making the decision about admitting students. And if they're really invested in you know, a, a student, they may ask the uh, admissions committee to uh, you know, carefully consider like 
admitting that part of your student, but mostly that won't happen. So it's useful to establish a connection with a potential advisor or committee member uh, ahead of time, but that is unlikely to have any effect on your prospects of admission to a, to a program. Yes, uh, one, one big question for the admission committee members is that, is this applicant going to finish? What are the, what's the probability of successful defense? And so when you will be communicating to these uh, people, uh, whether through private email or through the graduate school application, you will need to make the best, the convincing case that you have uh, you know, knowledge and skills and ability to learn um, and conduct original research, which will result in a strong uh, uh, dissertation. So that would be, that's the goal, uh, ultimate goal of the, of the degree. Yeah, I agree absolutely with that. It's, uh, uh, it's a, uh, somebody failing uh, the university, a PhD, particularly in a European style, um, is often seen that the supervisor is the failing. Um, because they took somebody on without knowing what they wanted to do and then they didn't guide them sufficiently well. So from a, from a sort of university management point of view, um, uh, you shouldn't take on a PhD student that you think is going to fail, only take on people who you think are going to succeed. Is that too cynical? Sorry, Alex. <laughs> no, no, I think we have provided a good base. Uh, <laughs> We have, you know, our, our students are all over uh, the world in graduate schools, master's, PhDs. I, um, so I, I have no doubt in our ability and our students' ability. Um, Actually, that's one thing I was going to maybe suggest that we could do, because it's been a very long meeting, and I know we're beginning to lose uh, people, but uh, it, might, it might be possible, given we've got the Zoom thing, that we might set up a Zoom with our former graduates who are doing masters and PhDs, you know, to get, you know, to get the customer's experience, if you like, um, sometimes better than getting the, uh, yeah, you know, getting the view of people who are trying to sell their courses. So uh, maybe we'll, in the future, we'll set up something like that. Yeah, we'll do, yeah. Well, we have one last question. Um, it's sort of a long one, but I think if, if we just want to have anyone who wants to have final comments on it. Um, but the summary of it is, are there any particular preferences for research works in different universities? Particularly, do particular universities value different types of research um, or a preference by region depending on where you're studying at? Do you want a short answer? Yes. <laughs> which is why it's important to put some work into choosing the university and uh, knowing what their specialisms are, et cetera, really increases your chances. And it also, I go back to a point that was made, you know, a lot earlier, I think, uh, actually, I think you made it. It was uh, that um, when you're picking a university, actually somewhere you'd like to live with people that you know are interested in your area it might be better than going to the league tables and picking out somewhere you think is, uh, is fancy because, I don't want to name a university, but its initials are LSE. And if you went, um, if you uh, uh, went to it, uh, you know you couldn't afford to live in the centre of that capital city. It's an it's an enormous program, so you'd very rarely get to meet, you know, your uh, supervisor, etc., because they can't afford to live there either. Uh, so picking a small, smaller location, you know, with a good department, can actually uh, can lead to, to to greater success. I think uh, so. Uh, I think if, if any of our students want to seek advice about particular places, you know, they could approach us individually. We might have be able to give them advice about particular places. I, I would agree with that assessment as well. And the same, I think, largely applies in the U.S. You know, some places are just more expensive than others. And um, one of my former bosses worked at an Ivy League school, well, Columbia University in New York City, and he went to his department chair and he had tracked his, you know, salary for two or three months in an Excel spreadsheet and showed him he was literally breaking even, not even, you know, having money to save and having two kids with subsidized housing. 
So it, you need to take that into account. But when you talk about like actual schools in the US, the divide is, can be substantive and methodological, right? So certain schools are known for doing certain things really well or focusing on that, right? Like University of Michigan and like American politics and public opinion, but they also have some people who do international conflict, that sort of stuff there. Then there's a methodological divide, right? Like I kind of said earlier, like, you know, Chicago isn't necessarily known for uh, statistics, whereas somewhere like Ro Rochester is, right? Or MIT is known for doing really good qualitative work um, right across the town, you know, from, Har uh, from Harvard, right? So you really need to kind of do background research and have a general idea at minimum, right, of what you want to do when you go into it. And, and keep in mind, you know, methods, whether they're quantitative or qualitative, they're like skills, right? You can use those elsewhere. If you don't end up going into academia, but you know how to use statistical programs or you have multiple, you know, most of you, all of you speak English, right? In Kazakh or Russian or to some degree, those are skills, right? Those can be used elsewhere, much like, you know, like with a welder, welding, or, you know, a plumber and plumbing, those can be used outside of academia and it adds value, but you need to find a home where that can maybe work for you. Particularly in the U.S. system, um, knowing what your knowing what the people at your department, knowing the people at the department and what they specialize in, will is a leading off point for what you're going to do. So you can't. It's you, you probably could write a dissertation on a subject completely unrelated to anyone that's on your dissertation committee. My suggestion is don't do that. It's a recipe for disaster. It will not go well for you. You won't have anyone who can really advise you on where you're going. Um, I've met people who've had this problem who get halfway through a PhD and realize they need to change universities because they, what they wanted to pursue, the area they have interest, they went for a name rather than for who they could actually work with at that university. So it's extremely important that you make sure that if you have a area of interest or a specific interest that there's one or more professors at that university that can work with you on that subject, um, be, be that both substantive and methodologically. Um, so that's a very important to do, um, having, finding people who can work with you, finding people who, because that's going to be a very hard wall to overcome in the long run. Um, I think we are out of time now. Um, so thank you for everyone for participating. Um, does anyone have any last comments they want to make before we close? Well, we'll have, uh, Abzal is asking about economics. Can economic students be admitted to a PhD student, uh, PhD degree in political science? Um, why not? I would say that uh, a methods heavy school, they will be preferred over people with yeah. policy undergrads. If you want to go to Rochester, like do, you, do an econ undergrad yeah. first. But, but stay with economics, right? You'll probably make more money. That's true. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about the job prospects, but just a general inclination. This is, this is getting too cynical, too cynical. <laughs> but, yeah, economics has no problem transitioning to political science. Yeah, it's Fine, pro probably to easier to go from econ to poli sci than poli sci to econ. Many, many departments actually prefer students with some background in mathematics or economics, so that won't be a problem at all. And so we will have more workshops like this, but we'll be more focused on, uh, on practical steps and the cover letters and statements of for a purpose and uh, writing samples and making CV um, and so forth. So, and then we will schedule one workshop with the, our alumni, uh, your students who finished Bachelor of Political Science and International Relations from NU and went uh, and studied uh, in graduate schools abroad. And we'll try to get uh, geographically representative and uh, Simple and also the sub, sub you know, different variation in terms of subfields, in terms of the majors. Uh, okay, again, thank you very much for joining, for being so patient with us. All right. Bye. Everybody. Bye.